you know, it really is my privilege uh, to be here and to, to see you and meet you. I met Jonathan a few months ago, and like he said, you know, it, our hearts just kind of connected. I loved his passion, uh, his, his desire to want to do the very best for God and to get a sense of what God was doing and wanted to do here in GCC. But the reality is you don't really know me and I don't really know you. But that could be good because then there's no preconceived ideas. And we can do what we all came here to do, and that was to hear a word from the Lord. And it's my prayer that he would deposit in us you know, a word that would help us, especially as we are on this series of trying to pursue Jesus and what does that mean. And there's one passage that I want us to study this morning that has a great impact on that. I lived for many years in Chicago, and Chicago is known for its horrible winters where there's an enormous amount of snow. And inevitably, most people who drive in Chicago at some point will find themselves sliding off the road into the side. And if there's a lot of snow there, your car gets stuck. You can always know when somebody isn't really from Chicago and they've slidden off the road because they're doing everything they can do to get their car unstuck, but their wheels are just spinning and spinning and spinning. And I thought it's sometimes a picture of us in our faith. We get stuck. And we're doing whatever we think we should be doing, but it feels like the wheels are just spinning and spinning and spinning, and we stay stuck. And God doesn't want any of us to be stuck in our faith. He wants us to pursue after him with a joy and a hope and a faith. And sometimes we look at people in our world, our family members, our spouse or our kids, and they seem stuck. And if we don't understand a very important biblical principle, we remove ourselves from being able to help others get unstuck as well. And I want you to open your Bibles to Mark chapter 4, and we're going to look at this key truth that Jesus gives the disciples that has been really helpful for me in my life in having a radical discipleship for Jesus. Mark chapter 4, verse 1. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. Let's stop there for a second. Jesus taught a lot, and sometimes he taught in public, but usually when he teaches a parable, he does it to a smaller group of people, but not this time. You know, Mark's really clear. There's all these people. They've come from every town, every village. They kind of look like you all do, every color, every size, every shape, every language, every background. And he wants them all to hear this because this is a truth for everybody. We have to be honest. Everybody gets stuck. Sometime in our journey of faith, we find ourselves feeling like we're just spinning our wheels. And so what he teaches is for everybody to hear. Look at verse 2. He taught them many things by parables, and in his teaching said, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. Then Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. When Jesus taught this parable, everybody listening to him 2,000 years ago would have had a very clear picture of what he was talking about because he used a farming metaphor, and many of them were farmers. But they weren't farmers like we know farming. When we think of farming, we think of vast fields and major machinery. But in their mind, they would have thought about their plot of land, their one acre. And as he described these different types of soil, they would have thought, you know, he's right. On my acre, there are people who keep walking across it, cutting the corner so they can get to their place faster. And the more they walk, the harder that ground gets. And that pathway, because so many people have walked on it, seed doesn't really take root. And they would think about the rocky Palestinian soil, and they would go, yeah, there's a patch on my acre where it's really rocky. And, you know, the seed goes in, but it doesn't go very deep. And any kind of a storm comes, and I lose that fruit. They would think about another area of their acre where there were weeds that would grow up and they would choke the plants if they didn't get rid of those weeds. And they would think about one section where it was just naturally fertile. In their mind, they would understand that Jesus really here is talking more about the soil than anything else. 
He mentions a sower and he mentions seed, but he's really talking about the soil because he, what he wants the followers of him back then and what he wants us to know is that really following Christ begins not with what you do on the outside, but it begins with the condition of your heart. Following Christ is not about an obligation to follow certain rules. It's really your ability to receive what God has for you. So he goes on, look at verse 10. When he was alone, the 12 and others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables, so that they may be ever seen but never perceiving, and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? Oftentimes, when Jesus would tell a parable, he wouldn't explain it. But this time, he knows how important it is, so he wants to explain it. And he says, this is really important. He says, if you don't get this, you won't get anything else. If you can't get a hold of this truth, everything else isn't quite fit. It really begins here. The kingdom of God is available for you. The resources of heaven, life of hope and faith. But it begins with this understanding. This parable is not just about heaven and hell. It's not about one in four people get saved. It's actually about your life today and how you can walk in all that God has for you and how you can help others walk in all that God has for them. And so he explains the parable. Look at verse 14. He begins by saying this, the farmer sows the word. The seed is the word of God. It's small, but it multiplies. In the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1, it's the very same word used for Jesus. It's as if he's saying, listen, this is about planting Jesus in people's hearts. And I'm always wondering, why wouldn't somebody want Jesus? Why wouldn't that seed find soil everywhere? When you think of what he offers, eternal life, hope, peace that passes understanding, joy, all the promises of the Bible, you would think that it would be a slam dunk. Everybody would be open to Jesus. But Jesus wants us to understand something. That the seed needs a certain kind of soil in order for it to really take root in our heart. That when we get stuck, the issue is deep in our heart that we've got to look at that helps us to get unstuck in what God wants to do. The story here is not about the seed. There's nothing wrong with the seed. Jesus is perfect. It's about the soil, the condition of our heart, and the different conditions that he's identified that reflects and affects our ability to receive. And if you look around, sometimes in your life or sometimes in other people's lives, you discover, wow, this is the condition of their heart is this condition of my heart. So he explains these three conditions of the heart. Here's the first one, verse 15. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Here's what he talks about. He says there are people whose heart is very hard. It's like when you walk to make a path, you walk on it, you walk on it, you walk on it, and the more you walk on it, the harder a path becomes. And it's a picture of people's hearts. When people get walked on and walked on and walked on and walked on, what they do is they create this hard covering over their heart, and they say, nobody's going to pierce this anymore. I will not anybody, let anybody hurt my heart anymore. And they become hard. And no matter what seed is thrown at their heart, it doesn't matter. It bounces off. Why? Because their heart has become hard because of the hurt that they've experienced. When I was in university, I worked at a gas station, a petrol station. Uh, and I, there was a guy who worked at the booth next to me. And so we would talk sometimes. He wasn't a believer. And actually, he smoked a lot of dope. So he would come pretty stoned to work. And we would have these conversations. And the more dope that he smoked, the more interesting the conversations were, actually. But any time I tried to talk about God, the conversation would stop. And finally, one day he came to work, and he was pretty stoned. So I thought, I'm going to see if I can get him to talk about this. And I asked him about his story, just like we were talking about story. He told me how he had such a great mom and dad and had a great family life until he was 11 years old, and then his dad met God, supposedly. But it turned his dad into a legalistic tyrant 
And all of a sudden now, as an 11-year-old boy, he could never do anything right anymore. He was never good enough. He was never holy enough. For the next seven years, his dad walked on him and walked on him and walked on him and walked on him. And he created a hard covering over his heart. It was a way that he would protect himself. And I remember him looking at me saying, Joel, if you believe that God is love stuff, you're an idiot. Because my dad said he was a Christian. Jesus says, this is the conditions of some people's hearts. Where they've been walked on and walked on and walked on. And they create this protection so that seed just bounces off. Let this be a word for those of us who are parents If you walk on your kids too many times, too hard, they will create a covering over their heart that will protect them. Jesus wants us to understand, and maybe you're here, and you have been walked on and walked on and walked on by a family member or a spouse or somebody else, and you say, no more, never again. I'm going to protect myself. Nobody will hurt me again. And you cover your heart, and you get stuck, and you can't move forward. There's a second condition. Look at verse 16. Others, like seeds sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. They would understand that the Palestinian soil system was rocky, so it would be hard to get a decent root system going down. Jesus uses this to talk about people's heart condition. That people are open to Christ, but when their life is full of difficulties, when you have so many troubles, it's really hard to focus on your faith. And I had this happen to me when I was pastoring. A lady asked me to go visit her son who was in prison, and I went to visit him. And every month for seven months I went to go visit him. We developed a bit of a friendship And two months after I had visited him seven times, all of a sudden there was a knock on my front door, and it was him, and he kind of startled me because now he's here in my front door. And I got really nervous like he wanted to move in and live with me or something. But he was inviting me to a party he was throwing because he was now out on parole. He had been in prison for multiple years, but now he was out on parole. He was free, so he was going to have a party. So I thought, I could go to a party. I'll support him that way. So I showed up at his apartment for the party, and it was me, this scrawny little white pastor, and 50 thugs, his friends. And they've got tattoos, and they're gangsters, and I mean, it's quite an intense scene. But I'm there just trying to fit in as best as I can. And it so impacted him that I would show up to this kind of a party that he came to church. And he raised his hand, and he gave his life to Christ. And it was so wonderful. And he would come occasionally to church, and I would see him. But as the months went off, I saw less and less of him. And probably eight months after he had been let out on parole, I got a letter from him. And I'll never forget that day when I opened the letter, because it was so tragic. The letter read something like this, "Uh, Dear Joel, thanks for trying to help me, but there's no hope for me. I'm heading back to prison. And he began to explain how when he got out of prison, he was a convict, so he couldn't get a job. But he had bills he had to pay, and demons from his past started to haunt him, and people from his past started showing up. And he made some really bad choices, and now he got caught, and he was going back to prison. The seed had been there, but the troubles of his world were so much, so many pains, So many demons that was hard for him to focus on his faith. And sure enough, now he's on his way back to prison thinking there's no hope for me whatsoever. This is what Jesus talks about. That there are people in our world and their life is really tough. And sometimes we see a family member or a friend And they seem to have made some kind of conviction of faith, but then their life doesn't seem to follow that. And we can become quickly judgmental when we have to ask the question, what's the condition of their heart? Are there so many trials and so much difficulty that they can't really see that seed take root? Because Jesus says that's one of the conditions that is there. And you may be here, and by some miracle you stumbled your way into church. And you feel like you are stuck 
in this spiritual thing because there's just difficulties, financial problems or medical problems, and it's hard to focus on your faith when your world is caving in around you. It begins with a condition of the heart. There's a third condition he gives us. Look at verse 18. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. And he talks about the, the wealth and the desires for things and the worries that come in. Wow, doesn't that describe our society? Wealth and the desires for things and the worry that sets in because of that. We moved from Chicago to California four years ago, so we sold many of our things to kind of start fresh. So when I got to California four years ago, I bought myself a 40-inch plasma TV. Very cool. Very, very cool. Put it on the wall. I love it. I watch, watch my sports with my 40-inch TV. This was four years ago. Six months after I bought it, they came out with a 50-inch TV. And every time I looked at my 40 inches, all I could see was the 10 inches I was missing. I had to have those extra 10 inches. Wealth and the desires and the anxiety that it creates. Every day we are inundated by advertising that does two things to us. It either makes us discontent because we don't have it or it gives us the feeling that we're entitled to it. I deserve it. And Jesus says, this is a condition of the heart where weeds grow up and it begins to choke you away, where you just no longer can really find yourself fruitful in your faith because of that condition of the heart. And for many parts of the world, this condition probably doesn't apply. But in my country, in my society, in America and New Zealand, this may be one of the easier places to live in the natural According to what Jesus teaches, it's probably one of the more difficult places to live in the spiritual because society bombards you every day saying you are entitled and if you don't have it, you should be discontent and it becomes a condition of our heart. And he gives the disciples these conditions of the heart because he wants them to understand very clearly that following Jesus does not begin with external obedience begins with your ability to receive his grace and his love and all that he has for you. But if the soil's not right, you'll never get it. We'll stay stuck. He gives us a fourth kind of soil. Verse 20. Others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. Some 30, some 60. Some 100 times what was sown. He says there is such a thing as good soil, but even with this good soil, you have to persevere. It's a process. You don't just pop up into maturity. But if you have good soil, the promise of God is you can have a hundred times fruitfulness. It may not happen overnight. You may have to work with it, but the key is soil. What Jesus wants us to understand through this parable is the key is the condition of our heart. Now, here's what we oftentimes don't get. When they would farm on their acre of land 2,000 years ago, they would do it in the opposite order we do it. We till the soil, then we plant the seed. They would plant the seed, and then they would till the soil. They would change the soil. And what Jesus is teaching the disciples is this simple truth. Soil can change. People's hearts can change. And for the kingdom of God to come into our lives, to have hope and peace, the answer lies not in the external, but in the changing of our heart. There's nothing wrong with the seed. Jesus is all we need. The sower is there, but it, is there soil there? Most of the time, we focus on just wanting to throw seed at people without ever asking the question, what's the condition of their soil? Parents do this a lot. We'll throw seed at our kids, throw seed at our kids without saying, wait a minute, what's the condition of their soil? If we don't understand soil, sometimes we give up on people. We think they'll never change. Sometimes we just wish they would go away. But soil can change. They can make that shift. We, my wife and I experienced this firsthand. We have three children. One of our, two of our kids are adopted. One, our son came to us when he was five years old. He's half 
uh, African-American, half Korean. So he's this beautiful boy. He came to us at five years old. He had a very, very rough first five years. He had adult men in his world that did not treat him well at all. And they pounded on him, and they pounded on him, and they pounded on him. So when he came to us as this five-year-old boy, he had such a hard shell over his heart, he was not going to let anybody in. He would never be hurt again. And my wife and I prayed, and we understood soil can change. God can change a heart, but it may take some time. So for a year, we just loved Josh. Because what changes a hard heart is love. And we loved him for a year, and finally he had been with us for a year, and we went one time out to, we were at the mall, and we were at a McDonald's. And so I was going to get him some food, which is probably not a healthy thing for a parent to do, but forgive me. So I said, okay, and Josh said, I would like a large order of French fries. I said, Josh, you don't need a large order of French fries. I'll get you a medium order of French fries. Now, you have to understand, to this point, our son, who had been with us for 12 months, never disobeyed. He never once disobeyed. And people would look at us as adopted parents and they would say, you're such great parents. He's only been with you for six months and look how much he obeys you so brilliantly. But remember what Jesus is teaching. It's about the heart, not about the external. And as parents, we knew there was only one reason why Josh didn't disobey. He was so afraid that he'd get moved and shipped to another house. It was all on the external. He had this hard covering over his heart. But a year had gone by of loving him and caring for him. So we got to McDonald's, and I ordered him the medium French fry. And I'll never forget that day because we're in the mall. And Josh, who has had this hard heart, has this medium French fry, and he knocks him over and yells, I want it large. My wife and I knew in that moment soil had changed because we knew Josh felt safe enough with us that he could rebel and not worry about being kicked out of the house. My wife began to weep, tears of joy. I was like doing cartwheels. I set them up again. I said, knock it over again, Josh. One more time. Come on, knock it over again. <laughs> because of his heart. Some of us are here, and on the outside, we do Christianity really well. But Jesus cares about the condition of our heart. He wants us to be safe enough that we can rebel against the Father and know we're not going to be kicked out of the house. This is why this parable is so important. You don't become a radical disciple of Jesus by gritting your teeth. You become a radical disciple of Jesus by having a heart that will receive everything he has for you. And we become wonderful Christ followers that influence the world by looking at people, not with judgment, but by asking, what's the condition of their heart Jesus lived with this model. Soil can change. People can change. He saw people beyond their stuckness. He saw who they could become if only their heart would change. Think of Zacchaeus, a crooked, corrupt tax collector who became a great giver, multiplied, multiplied by many times. Soil changed. Think of Nicodemus. A religious leader who was afraid and went to Jesus at nighttime to question him now became this bold person who helped Jesus come off the cross at his death. Think of Peter, a common everyday fisherman who would confound the scribes with his teaching. Soil changed. Think of Mary, a prostitute that societies that had absolutely no value. We would know her as one of the greatest worshipers of God recorded in Scripture. Why? Soil changed. Jesus knew the sinful reality of their lives, but he saw the possibility that could exist. He had this incurable faith of God working in them if it, their heart could change. And maybe there's somebody in your world today that in your mind you have given up on. You put them under what I call the probably not list. Probably not this year they're going to get saved. Probably not they're not going to. Jesus never had a probably not list. If we will be Christians who will accept this teaching and embrace it for them and for us, saying, could we believe that God can change hearts? Or maybe it reflects you, and you're here this morning, and it's been a struggle for you. If you'll open your heart to let him change the soil, he says, you can have a hundred times more of the kingdom. So how did Jesus change soil? How did he go and make disciples? Three quick stories.
Think of the story of the hard hearts. Jesus takes the disciples and he takes them across the lake one time and he comes to a place where there's a man and he has been ostracized by his village. The village has pounded on him and pounded on him. The man is chained up in a cemetery. There's evil all over him. And he comes up to Jesus and he wants to pick a fight because that's what angry, hurt people do. They want to pick a fight. Sometimes that's what your kids want to do. And they have these hard hearts. He wants to pick a fight. And I can imagine Jesus just wrapping his arms around the man. And the man melts. And he's delivered from his evil. And he wants to follow Jesus. But Jesus says, no, no, you go and you tell these cities about me. And he becomes a follower of Christ. Why? Because love changes the hard heart. It's not an easy thing. But those of us who have people in our lives who have hard hearts, what they need more than anything is an unconditional love and a grace that will carry them through and allow that to melt. When I was pastoring in the 80s, when AIDS had come to America and everybody was terrorized by it, at the end of the service, a man walked through the doors and he started walking up the middle aisle. And I could tell by the look on his body and his face that he had AIDS. And I knew without a doubt that for at least a year or two, he had been pounded on and pounded on predominantly by the church. And as he walked forward to me, I felt like God just nudged me. Don't say a word, just hold him. And as he came forward, I wrapped my arms around him. And for 15 or 20 seconds, he was as stiff as a board. And then just the miracle of God, he began to melt and weep. Soil changed because of love and if you're here and you've been hurt and you've got that hard covering, I would beg of you, have the courage to let God love you just a little bit. And you'll discover how good he is. Then there are those who have troubles he talks about. You know, the difficulties. Think of Mary and Martha with Lazarus and their brother dies. And what does Jesus do? He meets them at their point of need. He raises their brother. Why do you think Jesus went to village to village healing people and feeding people? He wanted to meet their needs. And if we're going to change soil for those people who have difficulties, we got to be a church that meets the needs of those difficulties. When we help people, we give them the opportunity to be able to focus on their faith because they're not so overwhelmed by all their difficulties. And if you're here and you are in trouble, whatever it may look like, have the courage to share that trouble so you can focus on your faith and not have it lose you. One of my heroes is a 28-year-old Indian girl. She's a teacher, an educator, and she went into a remote village in the foothills of the Himalayas. This village has never had a church, never had the gospel. Some church planters went there, but the villagers actually stoned the church planters and chased them out. She went in there, but she said this, I don't want to convert you, I want to help you. There's no education whatsoever for the children. So they work in the tea fields from the age of four onwards. One family gave her two children. For three months, she lived in a barn while she taught the two children. Then another family gave her a few more children. Over a period of a year or two, now she had 70 children from the families. What was she doing? She was helping them because the cycle of poverty will not stop without education. She was helping them in a real way. We had the privilege of helping her actually build a, a facility, a, a school for these kids. And I had the chance to go there for the dedication of this school. And I'll never forget standing up being asked to pray for the dedication. And I looked out over hundreds of these villagers who three years earlier had literally stoned church planters. Now they're at this dedication. And I said, let's bow our heads in honor of God who has provided for us. And hundreds of these villagers bowed their head in honor of God. They planted a church that now has 150 members. Why? Soil had changed. People who had real problems got help. And it allowed them to be open to the goodness of the gospel. That's what we do as a church. That's why we offer hope. This third and final type of soul, where the riches come in, that's so oftentimes characteristic of us. Remember the rich young ruler who came to Jesus and said, I have done everything I'm supposed to do. He's like the poster boy of Christianity. And Jesus says, that's great, but sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Because Jesus knew his soil would never allow him to grow into all that the kingdom of God had for him as long as the riches defined him. But the rich young ruler can't do it. And when he walks away, I don't think Jesus is angry. I think he's sad. Because I think he realizes how much more was available for this rich young ruler if he would not allow his wealth and the pursuit of that to define him. 
And when that becomes our soil, we need to be able to have the courage and the faith to become generous givers like God is a generous giver so our soil can change. I had a friend, and he's really wealthy. He came to church once a month. He was kind of stuck. So we had a camp that we hold for uh, special needs kids. And so I said, Mark, we need $5,000 for this camp. It's a four-day camp for special needs kids. Will you underwrite it? He said, sure. But for him, it was nothing. I knew that wouldn't change the soil enough. I said, Mark, it's really generous that you gave the $5,000, but you need to make sure that your money is being spent well, so you need to go to that camp for those four days, and you need to volunteer and help out. And he went. For four days, this very wealthy businessman played with special needs children, and his life was radically altered. He saw the joy on their faces, knowing most of them would never have careers or families he came back and he said, Joel, how could I have missed it? Do you know what had happened? Soil had changed. No longer wealth and desires and the weeds. Now the opportunity for the fullness of God. He had gotten unstuck. This parable is so important for us as we pursue Jesus. It doesn't begin with your religious habits on the outside. It begins with the condition of your heart. Would you bow your heads with me, please? I'm going to close this service by just giving you a minute to let the Lord speak to you in his grace and his love. Maybe there are some of you who are here and you have been hurt by others, so you have created this covering over your heart and you're not going to let anybody hurt you again. Can I encourage you to have the courage to let God's love pierce that hardness? You'll get unstuck. You'll discover such a grace, such a love you can always count on. Or maybe your heart is like that second condition of soil and you just have lots of problems. And those troubles are overwhelming you. They keep you up at night. It could be financial or health-related. And all those difficulties cause you to be stuck. Can I encourage you to share those difficulties? Let friends and family carry them with you. Or perhaps some of you are here like my friend Mark. And if you were honest, you'd say, I'm stuck because I want that 50-inch TV too. And the desires and the pursuits of wealth have choked. I'm going to pray in just a minute, and I'm going to ask that God, by his spirit, would graciously speak to each of us wherever we're at. And his love and his grace would empower us to, to get unstuck. That we would let him begin to change the condition of our soil. Lord, I thank you for each person in this room this morning. I thank you for their life. I thank you that they are here, not to hear my words, but to hear from you. I pray each person would be so aware of your love and your grace. thank you that Jesus walked this earth with a conviction that every one of us can change and that change begins in our heart Lord for those who have been hurt I pray you would shower your love into their heart and they would open up their hearts for that for those who have troubles Lord God I pray you would surround them with friends and family who would help them for those who have gotten distracted by the wealth of this world, Lord God, would you give them divine opportunities to be generous of themselves? Lord, you know the condition of our soil, and I pray that you would change it, that we would see a hundredfold fruit as we follow you. Lord, we pray for those who are in our lives 
maybe even some that we have given up hope on, Lord God. Thank you for reminding us, not just to look at the outside, but to ask the question, what's the condition of their heart? And would you position us, Lord God, to be people who can be used by you to change hearts? Give us a grace and a love. I thank you for GCC. Would you continue to lift it up as a church that just emanates your grace and love that when people come into this place, it is their heart that they would know can be touched and changed, Lord God. May we be a church that reflects the same level of faith and hope that Jesus had for everybody he met that they could change. Thank you, Lord, for this teaching, for your word. Thank you that you create in us fertile soil that we may live fruitful lives for you. We worship you and we love you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.